Being greater than I, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I trust that you are enjoying God's richest blessings at this season. Uh, today we begin a new sermon series. We're going to be taking a look at the subject of fasting. This is a subject that many Christians ponder and wonder about, this thing called fasting. What is it? How should it be done? When should it be done? Why should it be done? Uh, when we look through the scriptures, we don't see very much written about fasting, and even less that is in the way of instructions on the subject. As a result, many Christians today don't regard fasting as an essential discipline of the faith. That may very well be that because when they have tried it, they did not immediately receive any reward or the reward they were expecting from it, and so now they just ignore it. But when we look at the subject of fasting in the Bible, we find that it's one of those subjects that has to be studied the way the Lord told Isaiah to teach us to study. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. This is from Isaiah 28, 13. Okay, so for example, as we follow the trail of the subject of fasting through the scriptures, one of the breadcrumbs that we pick up on this trail comes from Jesus himself. And it comes not from what he did say, but, but from what he didn't say. In Matthew 6, which is the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus teaches about prayer, he begins with the statement, when you pray. Uh, don't pray like this, but instead pray like this, okay? But uh, notice what he didn't say. He didn't say, if you pray. I think we would all agree that the implication here is that Jesus cons actually really considers prayer to be a mandatory discipline of the faith. Likewise, Jesus follows the teaching about prayer with a teaching on fasting. And there, D Jesus does the same thing. He begins, the state, he begins with the statement, when you fast, uh, don't do like the hypocrites, but instead, you know, wash your face, comb your hair, brush your teeth, you know, you get the point, okay? But again, just like with prayer, notice Jesus does not say, if you fast. So just like with prayer, we must conclude that Jesus, Jesus considers fasting also to be a necessary discipline of the faith. Oftentimes, we have to redo a little reading between the lines to parse out the true meaning of Scripture. Okay, so for today, we find that one of the most in-depth teachings on this subject, such as it is, uh, is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 58. And that is what we will be taking a look at today. So uh, let's just go ahead and jump right in. But first, let's pray. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your never-ending stream of mercy, grace, and blessings, which you pour out upon us so richly and profusely. Lord, we just ask that today you, Lord, immerse us in this stream of your blessings. Lord, I ask that today you take me as a lump of clay and uh, put me on your potter's wheel and shape me into a vessel that is fitting for your use. Lord, send your teacher of truth that your people may be blessed today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chapter 58 begins with God instructing Isaiah to forcefully and stridently point out the sins of the house of Jacob, which is literally the nation of Judah. But for all of this to make sense, we need to understand the context. The context of chapter 58 comes from the previous chapter, chapter 57. In chapter 57, God has raked Israel over the coals for practicing idolatry. But he ends the chapter with the promise to forgive and to heal them. So now, in chapter 58, uh, verse 1, the Lord is telling Isaiah to lift up his voice stridently and forcefully. That is, like a trumpet, 
and point out to his people their sinfulness. I just happen to like the wording of this verse in the King James Version just a little bit better. I think it's a little more poetic, but, but it's also a little more intuitively easy to understand. Uh, let me show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, from Isaiah 58, 1 from the King James says, Cry aloud and spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Okay, now again, this is God's follow-up to his message of reconciliation at the end of chapter 57. He has told them that he hates their idolatrous ways. He has told them he will forgive them if they repent. And now he calls them to repentance and reconciliation. But he's making sure that they know what sins they need to repent of. So he tells Isaiah to go and tell them just what it is he has against them. And that is those sins which he has pointed out in chapter 57. Okay, are you with me so far? Very good. Okay, continuing on now. So now in verse 2 of chapter 58, God points out to Isaiah just how deeply ingrained is their hypocrisy. He tells Isaiah, when you show them their wickedness, they're going to act so pious and pretend like there's not a sinful bone in their bodies. He says, they come to the temple every day and seem de delighted to learn all about me. And he continues, they act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They even ask me for righteous judgments, that is, against their adversaries. They're pretending they want to be near me. Okay, so now what is God saying here? Let's dig into this verse just a little bit. Okay, He's saying that they come into my presence, into my worship services at the temple, acting very pious and righteous, as if they were faithful to my commandments, but that is just a sham, a phony pretense. God is saying that his people talked a good game, but their walk didn't measure up. In other words, they talked the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. That is to say, outwardly, they made a great profession of following the Lord, Inwardly, they were woefully lacking in some of the essential characteristics that God considered necessary to have a good relationship with himself. They held very strictly and precisely to the outward forms of religion, but they sorely neglected the basic principles of righteousness that those religious practices were designed to instill in them. So, for example, they fasted and they prayed. They observed the Sabbath. They paid tithes and offerings or returned tithes and offerings. They kept the solemn feasts. They attended the religious assemblies. Yet they continuously engaged in iniquity so abominable that God could barely stand them. This means they were like waffles. Their lives were compartmentalized. They had a religious life which they lived punctiliously according to the instructions of God. They were very precise in following those instructions. As a matter of fact, they even added more on to them. But on the other hand, they had their own personal lives which they stubbornly lived on their own terms. And in their minds, it was very easy for them to justify that these two compartments of their lives remained separate and distinct from each other. Never the twain should meet. Therefore, according to their thinking, as long as, the com as long as they kept the commandments and performed their religious duties, they were very much entitled to God's blessings and protection, no matter what other stuff they carried on in their personal lives. Mm. So here in chapter 58, God is calling them out. He is seeking to straighten out their erroneous thinking 
uh, that is to say, their stinking thinking, you might say, about what it takes to have a correct relationship with him. And he does so starting in verse 3 of chapter 58, using the discipline of fasting as his vehicle. Okay. God is illustrating to them how far off they are in their relationship with him by showing them how far they have missed the mark in the performance of their fasting. Okay, so now let's, take, let's, let's dive in now. Okay. God starts out with this little role play with Isaiah. He tells Isaiah, he says, here is what they are thinking. Okay, they will say, Lord, we have done all kinds of fasting before you, and you aren't even impressed. We have performed very rigorous, challenging fasts, and you have never noticed. And God says, my response is, I, I, yes, you got that right. I have not paid any attention to your fasting, and let me tell you why. And the reason why is because you fast to please yourselves. It is, in other words, it's because your fasting is all about you. But you've forgotten, there's nothing in you that is pleasing to me. Yes, I love you, God says, but that's because of who I am, not because of who you are or anything that you do. I love you in spite of yourselves. Okay. Furthermore, even in your fasting, you're scheming to take advantage of your fellow human beings. So God continues in verse, uh, verse 3, he says, you, have, you who have employees, you're always cooking up schemes to take advantage of your employees. Oh, and by the way, you who are employees, even in your fasting, you hatch plots to take advantage of your co-workers. You stick knives in each other's backs over promotions and pay raises. And so God is saying, I hate your fasting. I hate it because it does not produce in you the characters that I long to see. And so God clarifies. God explains in verse 4. In Isaiah 58, verse 4, he explains, What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. I'm back in the New Living Translation now. Okay. So tell me something, O oh greater than I. <coughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. O oh house of Jacob, he says. What makes you think that I am pleased with your fasting, while even in your fasting you quarrel and bicker with one another? This includes sniping and backbiting. And you hold on to grudges from many years ago. Am I supposed to be impressed with this type of character? Uh, then, moving on into verse 5, he says, you say, he says, you humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance. You bow your heads like reeds in the wind. You dress yourselves in burlap, other times called sackcloth and cover yourselves with ashes, sackcloth and ashes. Is that what you call fasting? Do you really think this will get you anywhere with me? Just like so many of us today, Israel religiously followed their particular forms of fasting. But what we find is that the spirit of true fasting was missing. Brothers and sisters, the fasting that God desires leads to more virtuous living, not to pretentious religion. Okay, let me explain this. Listen to what he says in verse 6. He says, no, this is the kind of fasting that I want. Fasting that leads you to free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Now, Take this statement both literally and figuratively. We need, to, we need to understand this statement both literally and figuratively. Those who have been literally jailed on trumped up charges and those who find themselves 
in un as unfortunate prisoners of circumstances. What are we going to do to help these people? This is a mission field that fasting calls us to. This is uh, what God is looking for, to come out of our fasting. In other words, fasting should make us champions of justice and mercy. Continuing in verse 6, the Lord says we are to lighten the burdens of those who work for you. And by extension, you to lighten the burdens of those who work with you. Okay? Let the oppressed go free. Now, so far, for the most part, God's condemnations here in chapter 58 have been aimed at the leadership of Judah. But get ready greater than I. He's coming down your street now. Okay? Open up your minds. Stop thinking literally only and start thinking spiritually. Okay? When he says, let the oppressed go free, this world is full of people who are under the oppression of sin. True fasting calls us to set them free. This is your calling. This is your mission field. Now can you see yourself in this picture greater than I? Now can you see a purpose for which God would have you to fast? He continues, remove the chains that bind people. Again, especially uh, the chains of sin, uh, spiritually as well as literally. Okay? Continuing with his clarification, God says in verse 57, share your food with the hungry. Okay? Give shelter to the homeless. That would be to those who need a temporal home on this earth and those who need an eternal home. Give clothes to those who need them, and that would be garments of cloth and garments of righteousness. So now from these two verses, verses 6 and 7, we learn that true fasting was designed to purify the motives and reform the life. The true purpose of religion is to release men and women from their burdens of sin, to eliminate intolerance and oppression, and to promote justice, liberty, and peace. God intended his people to be free, and we best represent him when we lead others into this freedom that he gives. True religion, we find, also is practical. Certainly, it includes the rites and ceremonies of the church, but it is in the daily life, the life lived before family, friends, neighbors, and co-workers, that the presence or absence of true religion shows up. It's not so much a matter of abstaining from food or whatever you choose to abstain from, so much as it is of sharing what you do have, be that food, clothing, shelter, love, relationships. Here you should be recognizing some similarity to Christ's Sermon on the Mount of Olives in Matthew 25, uh, specifically to, uh, verses 24 through 46. And this is the parable on the sheep, parable of the sheep and the goats. Okay. Uh, we're going to talk about this a little more in just a moment. But I'm just going to summarize here that from this message and from God's message here in Isaiah 58, what we're learning is that practical godliness is the only kind of religion recognized at the judgment bar of God. Now, we're going to come back to this a little bit more just in just a little bit. Okay, so greater than I, when we are able to get this fasting thing right, God has the most wonderful promises in store for us. Uh, continuing on with Isaiah 58 and verse 8, he says, Then your salvation will come like the dawn. Here again, this is another verse that I think the King James reading is a little more poetic and just a little more intuitively understood. Uh, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, the King James says. That is to say, 
this wording t touches upon the fact that Jesus is the light of the world. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he tells us that we are the light of the world. And then we can connect the dots to his instruction that we are to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. The translation to what I just said is, again, when we get this fasting thing right, then God can fulfill his promise of righteousness in us. Then he can truly shine out through us. And that is what our light really is. It is him shining out through us and call people out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so continuing uh, with verse 8, he says, And your wounds will heal quickly. Now, this really is not an obscure statement. It simply means that when you work for the temporal and spiritual benefit of others, you are personally rewarded mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. You all know that when you participate in a mission project, you just feel so good inside. That's healing taking place within you. And God is saying, when you get this fasting thing right, you will be healed in the same way. And again, uh, in verse 58, he says, your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Now, this is reminiscent of the experience of Israel in their wandering in the wilderness when they were led by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. But it also alludes to the, uh, how they were protected from the rear just as well by God's sustaining power. Uh, the translation here again is, when we get this fasting thing right, we can be assured that God has our six. Or for those of you not familiar with the vernacular, it means God has our backsides protected. Okay. Now, continuing on, uh, in verse 9, God continues with promises for learning to fast appropriately. God tells, Isa tells Isaiah, then... When you call, the Lord will answer. He will answer, yes, I am here. And he will answer quickly. Okay. Now, we tend to think of fasting as, some, as an exercise that puts our prayers on steroids. Okay. We think that when we fast, God has to answer our prayers. And, uh, well, anyway. Here, God, through Isaiah, gives us a different perspective. He tells us that fasting correctly puts our hearts in tune with God's heart. And this is what allows him to answer our prayers more quickly and more consistently, by being on the same wavelength with him. Okay, so uh, in verse 59, God, God gives us this clarification on what fasting should do in us. He says, remove the yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Mm, okay, now, what is this yoke of oppression that he is talking about? Okay, uh, well, it's really not that, not that difficult. You see, uh, these two statements, remove the yoke of oppression, stop pointing your finger, and spreading vicious rumors. <clears throat> these two statements both mean the same thing. One explains the other. We tend to think of a yoke of oppression as physically mistreating or abusing someone, which is true, okay? But again, you know, open your mind's eye and look at what God is really saying to Isaiah. Okay. The Seventh-day Adventist commentary on this verse offers this explanation on this verse, removing the yoke of oppression. Okay. By criticism, fault-finding, gossip, and innuendo, many professed Christians make the burdens of their fellows almost too heavy to bear. Many a noble Christian has been crushed and sent to his grave in discouragement and defeat 
by having the finger of scorn pointed at them by a fellow Christian. God cannot draw near to his people while they are engaged in criticizing and oppressing their fellows. This is from volume 4, page 306. So from this we learn that this heavy yoke of oppression uh, can be your tongue used in an ungodly fashion. And when he says remove the heavy yoke, it simply means close your mouth. There's a lot more that could be said there, but I don't want to digress. Okay. So now moving on uh, in uh, verse 10, God continues his explanation of what he's looking for in our character development. He says, feed the hungry, help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you and the and then and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon okay the lord will guide you continually giving you water when you are dry restoring your strength like an ever like an ever flowing spring thank you okay so now notice here verses 10 and 11 is a, rep is a repetition of the format of verses 6, 7, and 8. Okay. By both of these passages, similarly, we learn that we are to develop behaviors that rightly represent the character of God. Then God will cause our light to shine so brightly, and he will bless us in all of the straight places of life. Okay, now, remember that I said previously, you know, uh, in uh, these two uh, passages here, uh, 6 and 7, 6, 7 and 8, 10 and 11, he talks about these things about, uh, you know, uh, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, bringing the stranger into your house. Okay, I remember I said to you that practical godliness is the only kind of religion recognized at the judgment bar of God. <clears throat> okay, so uh, what this is pointing to is the fact that here in Isaiah 58, the kinds of behaviors that God is looking to see fasting produce in us are the same behaviors that Christ is looking for when he describes the judgment in Matthew 25, 34 to 46. This is the description of the judgment presented by Christ through the parable of the sheep and the goats. So now, in summary, in this parable, the king rewards those who inherit the kingdom because, he says, when he was hungry, they fed him. He says, when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a foreigner, you welcomed me into your home. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, you cared for me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And so then they asked him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and we fed you, thirsty and we gave you something to drink, a foreigner and we welcomed you into our homes, naked and we clothed you, and in prison and we visited you? And of course, you know the Lord's response. He says, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the least of my, these my brethren, you have done it unto me. <clears throat> and so we see it is to make our hearts resemble the heart of God. And this is what draws men and women to see the beauty of his love, his love for them. And this is what causes him to see beauty in us. And so at this time, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> as we consider these uh, instructions on fasting, we, we are to deeply consider, we are to deeply consider not what fasting does for God, but what God intends for fasting to do for us, and that is to turn our hearts into hearts like his. So at this time, would you please take out your connection cards 
If you're worshiping with us online, you can download your connection card by texting the letter CC to the numbers 301-321-8848. And please uh, make the uh, respond to the following questions, please. What did you hear God say to you as you followed along with this presentation? Did you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Or did you have an aha moment? Okay. Question number two. How are you going to respond to God about what he said to you? What is your I will statement? Are you going to tell God, I will do such and such, whatever? Okay. And question number three. How can we, greater than I, as a church, come alongside you and help you in your response to God? Thank you very much for, uh, for worshiping with us today. And would you please bow your heads and let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we have uh, today looked at the discipline of fasting and as we have looked at the instructions of what you have, how, what you have shown us that you desire for fasting to produce in us, what you desire for fasting to produce in our hearts, O oh Lord God. We ask that you would endow us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, to tune our hearts into to tune our hearts in with yours, Lord, to tune our lives in with yours. Lord, knit our hearts tightly together with thine and with each other, Lord that we may be one with thee. Bless us, O Lord, and keep us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you very much, greater than I. May you be blessed.